Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about cemetery etiquette. But along with that, we're going to go over the definitions of graveyards versus cemeteries, do's and don'ts when visiting a cemetery, the types of materials used for gravestones, the different types of gravestones, and the meaning of symbols on them, several examples. Sorry. So what is the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery? A graveyard is always connected to a church and it's typically within the churchyard. Um, these tend to be smaller than a cemetery due to the church only owning so much land. And there are several churches actually that have very strict rules as to who can be buried in their graveyard. Examples of this would be limited to church members, individuals of the same faith, and only so many family members. A cemetery does not have to be connected to a church, but they can be associated with one. An example would, of this would be a church in one location, but the cemetery that maybe they have bought the land for is located in a different place. There are not as strict rules and it's much larger. And again, usually cemeteries are much larger than graveyards. That's why you'll hear the term city cemetery. They are typically very large. Individuals of various faiths can be buried in a cemetery. So it doesn't matter if they are Jewish, Christian, Catholic, atheist, non-believer of anything, they are allowed to be buried there. Some cemeteries do have requirements though as to the type of headstone allowed. For this, if you've ever noticed, there are some cemeteries that only allow a bronze marker that is completely flat to the ground. This is usually for the purpose of uh, maintenance of the cemetery, so uh, cutting the grass and so forth. So some cemeteries do require a specific headstone. And also for a cemetery, you need permission to bury ashes in a cemetery. For a graveyard, in, in a church graveyard, you're allowed to put those ashes there. So appropriate cemetery etiquette. The first rule of visiting a cemetery is to do not disturb any mourners or if there is an act of funeral. So if you're taking pictures, um, trying to transcribe headstones and take notes and somebody comes in who is visiting an ancestor or who is just coming to mourn basically and they are near you, you need to stop what you're doing and go to a different area or come back at a different time, especially if a funeral is going on. You want to respect those people who are there. Always obey posted rules. So some church graveyards may have restrictions on who and when visitors are allowed. Photography is sometimes limited at church graveyards and only go during the times permitted. Um, many people, especially, you know, in October and Halloween, they think of going to cemeteries late at night. That is usually forbidden for most of them, unless it is a special occasion. Be mindful of where you step or sit. You don't wanna walk directly on graves, even those of stone. Um, in order, in older cemeteries, often the coffin may have caved in and so if you have too much weight above it on the ground, the ground could fall in as well. And a lot of times you'll see even um, stone uh, markers that have caved in a great deal. So this is an example of posted rules. Um, the one on the left is a church cemetery, which has that. And it's got, you know, no trespassing, but it does say families and friends may visit or tend the graves of, of their uh, family. And on the right, this is a privately owned cemetery. And so it is, you notice it says that it's not a church cemetery, but it has family members only. So make sure you obey these rules. These are examples of various graves that have caved in. The one on the left, um, most of these older stones, they were simply buried 
on the ground or within the ground with grass over them. But family members who have had more people buried there, they have liked to make them plots. And then they put stones, gravel, um, all types of things over it. And that actually adds weight to it. So that's an example of a very old grave that's caved in. On the right, this is an example of a brick um, grave that probably had a maybe a cement slab or even bricks over it, and it has completely caved in. So inappropriate cemetery etiquette. Do not cause excessive noise. If someone is with you, but they choose to stay in a vehicle, do not play loud music. It is best to leave pets like dogs at home, which this should be a no-brainer, but some people do. So even if animals are allowed, I recommend leaving them at home. And this is for a matter of safety as well as respect. Um, safety, if you have an animal or a larger dog that might wander around touching stones, they could fall for one, or they could even fall in a grave that is caving in. But also respect. You cannot completely control what your pet does. So you don't want an animal walking over the graves, at least one that you have brought there. Do not leave any trash when visiting a cemetery. So this includes water bottles, fruit food. So even if it is perhaps an apple that, you know, might feed other animals, you do not want to leave anything, especially cigarette butts. Um, be mindful of the mementos you may leave at an individual grave as well. So there are a lot of people may put small objects, uh, coins, rocks, things like that uh, as a memento and remembrance of someone. But you want to be careful what you leave, especially if it's something that has uh, personal information on it or that somebody might be enticed to steal. These are examples of leaning headstones. So you can tell they're old. One of them is having to be supported by a board. So again, if your animal is walking through and happened to bump it, it could fall and break. These are fallen monuments. So these are stones that were quite heavy and you see they have completely fallen and one of them it has it completely caved in. Um, things to be attentive of when visiting a cemetery or a graveyard. Always wear sensible clothing and shoes. There can often be small thistles or briars, which I'm sure several people are familiar with down in the southern states, especially if the grass might be tall. And then also insects, especially ants. <laughs> they can be everywhere. It does not have to be a grassy area. I visited one cemetery that almost the entire place had stones and rocks, but there were ants everywhere. Um, if you're visiting in the summer, you want to always be aware of your surroundings because there can be snakes. So a lot of um, people who do go to cemeteries regularly, they recommend that you go probably in fall, winter, or spring because summer, there can be snakes around all over that you might not see. If the cemetery is on private property, you always need to get permission first before going. And if you're going to a small cemetery, maybe a family um, cemetery that is secluded, take someone with you, have a buddy that goes there. And this is also the case if you are actually in a metropolitan area that has a very large cemetery or older cemetery, because unfortunately you might find several vagrants there. So that is becoming more popular for them. This is an example of pictures I've taken. Um, on the left you can see that there is a large snake skin and that was actually only one of several. So you want to be again careful of snakes. Luckily I had gone in winter so these were just the skins. And on the right, it's slightly difficult to see, but these are two large ant beds. But I took this picture from at least 15 feet away, and you can still see the size of the ants. 
So you want to be very careful of various insects, bugs that could be around. These are the types of materials used for gravestones. So some of these aren't necessarily in use anymore, but you can still see them in many places. So you have field stones, which these are probably some of the first and they are just rocks that have been um, put basically in a mound to represent the grave. Wooden markers, which many people would see or, or know of wooden crosses that were left, which most of the time those are rarely available to see because they have not survived time, but you can still sometimes find regular wooden markers as a headstone. Um, cement used to be used in the mid 1900s. A lot of people and earlier, a lot of people weren't able to afford headstones. And so they kind of created their own where they made them out of cement and then they uh, drew the names and the information on it. You can also have bronze plates. Um, these can be put directly into the ground or installed in a stone. Some people have even gotten creative uh, creating markers from PVC piping. Um, sometimes in the New England area or even down south, you will see uh, gravestones made of seashells. Or you might just see several seashells left at the grave. You can also have iron markers. Slate was one of the um, main materials that was used at the beginning in New England and Massachusetts, for example, for headstones. This is a fairly sturdy stone. Um, most of these appear quite dark today, but you can still read the inscriptions. And then they began to use sandstone, limestone, because it was just easier to get once travel was made. Um, marble stones, which are still very common today, and of course, granite. Granite is probably one of the most common uh, materials for headstones today and marble, but granite is very hard and can stand the weathering and time period. White bronze markers were very popular after World War I and also zinc markers. And you can look all of these up online to kind of see the different materials. So what is the difference between a grave marker, a headstone, and a gravestone? Many people might use these terms uh, interchangeably, but these are the actual definitions of each. So a grave marker is a flat bronze plaque that is installed on a stone to identify the deceased. And a headstone is an upright monument that identifies the deceased. A gravestone is an inscribed headstone or grave marker. So therefore the term to kind of describe any type of marker in a cemetery or graveyard would be a gravestone, even if it is technically made of a different material. So this is example of the bronze marker on the left. So you can see that it has been installed in the stone. These can uh, turn quite dark over time and usually they just need a little bit of cleaning to make them much brighter again. And on the right is just a headstone. So it's upright, it has information on there. And on headstones you will typically see several symbols uh, carved in there. And most of these are very symbolic and have special meanings. So what are the different types of gravestones? Um, some of these are types and then features. So you can have a niche in a stone and this would be basically a place to put something in there. Some older ones that are headstones, they might have a niche for a photograph and something put over it. On many uh, Jewish headstones, they will have a small niche that rocks can be placed in. You have a tomb and then there is a vault, which there can also be a false tomb and things like that. A tablet stone, a ledger stone, 
obelisk, cremation memorials, mausoleum, columbariums, uh, statues, bevel headstones, and slant headstones. So I'm going to show examples of most of these. I don't have several picture or pictures of the columbariums, but that would be an example of many um, burials that are stacked up. Basically, they are, it looks like a wall. So there are many, many graves, but they are upright. They're above the ground on top of each other. This is something you can kind of pause later to look at. This is showing you just basically a blank type of various headstones. So, and these have changed over time. So some used to be very popular and aren't in use anymore. And then others are still relatively used. So this is a standard tablet stone. So you see it's an upright, uh, has 90 degree angles. It is flat at the top. These are rounded tablet stones, which obviously you can tell it's just that the top is rounded. These are arched headstones, which you might see several of these that are a little bit more ornate. A beveled headstone is also sometimes called a slant. So it is not flat to the ground. It rises up, but the back or the top of the headstone is higher up than the bottom. So these basically are leaning. It's usually close to a 45 degree angle, but not always. And these are bolster headstones, which they were somewhat popular for a little while and then not used nearly as much. They're very unique. So it is simply a cylinder type stone that is on its side where it is carved. The reason these are not particularly popular is they are hard to keep in place and then obviously they can uh, roll to a certain degree and the grass or ground cover up the inscription. These are flat headstones, so these are made of stone, but they are flat to the ground and level. Um, the picture on the right, you can tell that is mostly um, dirt. So some of it has been washed away at various times, but some cemeteries will only allow you to have flat headstones for the purpose of, again, maintenance and lawn mowers and things like that. This is called a Gothic tablet stone. So you can see that it's much more ornate at the top and it has um, the top of it usually has at least three to five maybe different shapes at the top. This is a trefoil headstone. So kind of sounds like the name. There are going to be three different round parts at the top. These are ledger stones. They are flat to the ground um, and basically covers up where the grave is. And some cemeteries you see almost uh, these stones only. And then often you might see older ledger stones and then family members have put a headstone at the top at a later date. These are wedge stones. So you can see that it has a ledger stone and then at the top it has a wedge that actually is rounded that goes up. Other people call these bed stones because it looks like a bed with a pillow. And you also notice on the right, um, this is a child's grave and you see seashells and stones on there. So those are little mementos that uh, family have left. This is a tomb. So a tomb is a raised above the ground and has each of the bodies above ground. And the information can be on the top, on the side, but this is specifically for one individual or maybe a husband and a wife. It's not gonna be multiple. These are false tombs. So on the left side, you can obviously tell that it had a cement ledger stone originally, and then they put um, a false tomb on top. And this is actually one that is made of the zinc. And then on the right, again, a lot of people use cement and different materials. So the original graves were false tombs. 
And then at a later date, someone came and put the headstones there in the footstone for identification. These are a vault tomb. So it, they are raised above the ground, but the body is not actually above the ground. It is still below. On the left, you can tell that this has um, been put over perhaps a brick grave. And on the right, it appears that they are um, raised a good bit, but if you look in the back, you can see an example of another one that it, they are not raised enough for a coffin or casket to be above it, above ground inside of it. These are called Woodmen of the World headstones. This was kind of a fraternal uh, group where there was actually insurance in there, so they would help pay for these uh, headstones. And it's very typical, you will, to, you will see at the top the round mark and it will tell you Woodmen of the World. And they are carved like trees. So these are very intricate. Um, you can see bark, stumps, and various things. They're very detailed. And they might have other symbols on the bottom, as you see down here, calla lily. These are two other examples. Um, this is much uh, clearer so that you can read it. And often it'll have what looks like a rope hanging from a broken uh, limb. And then this one, you can't see the top, but it actually has a book up there, which would indicate a Bible and a very religious person. And these might look similar, but they are simply tree trunk markers. So you'll notice that there is no symbol for the woodman of the world, but they still appear to be a tree. And these have also symbolic meanings to them that we'll go over a little bit later. Obelisk are something that are very common. You typically see a lot of times this can represent the person's wealth or importance in the community. Um, and obviously the taller and larger the obelisk, the more important they might have been. On the left, that is actually my third great grandfather's uh, gravestone. You can tell it was put up a little bit later than when he died, but he was not exactly a rich man by any means. He did own a lot of land, but was a farmer, but he was very um, notable person in town. So many people knew him. He had lived there for a very long time and was very well known. These are smaller obelisks. So here you can tell that the inscriptions are engraved on them and it's a little bit difficult to see, but over here it is right there. On the much taller obelisk, it's usually gonna be at the very base of it. And of course, these have the points at the top that are just the four-sided. The one on the right is another one of my third great-grandmother's grandparent. And you probably noticed from the how to properly clean headstones, this is one that was a picture taken before I had cleaned it. These are called vaulted obelisk, and that's due to the top of it. So instead of it just having the four points, it actually has other features in it. So they could be round or they could be kind of pointed. So here's an example of a vaulted obelisk and then a dome top obelisk. So this is kind of like a covered urn, but you would see that it is still pointed at the top in the form of an obelisk. And you can also see two others in the back that are like this. On the left, you have a truncated obelisk. So you see that it comes out in different ways before it goes up to the top. And the same, it's a truncated with an orb obelisk. So you see the points here, but then there's something else on top of it and then with an orb. And you can see several other obelisk type headstones in the background as well. These are rooftop obelisk. So instead of just being vaulted, they have more than one point at the top. So these will go up and kind of resemble, obviously, rooftops. Then you have brick uh, gravestones. 
And again, these were common for individuals who did not have enough money to buy or purchase a headstone um, or even have a cement stone at times. They're often unmarked graves. Many times if you're visiting an older cemetery, you really want to be careful if you're just walking in the middle and see clear land or a large area that there is no stone because often you might see just a single brick through the grass or a few and that's a very old um, grave that has just been grown over. And if you see these stone, these brick graves, and then all of a sudden a headstone or a footstone, that's usually put there at a later date by family members. So these are examples of cement stones. And on the left, you can tell that they carved the information themselves. And this was, this happened often, like I said. So they would just build a small frame uh, pour the cement in over where the grave was and then carve it, carve the information. On the right, it is simply a very large cement stone that is for a husband and a wife. This is another example of a cement slab with marble decorations. And this could be for children oftentimes, but they're simply uh, marbles that are placed in there for a design. And at the top, that is actually carved in there instead of being engraved. For children, you can often find uh, what's called a cradle grave. So for example, the one on the left, you can tell that that headstone was placed much later. And this is actually a small design. It is made of bricks, but it's kind of like a cradle for the child. On the right is another example. Um, when this one was first placed, there would not have been the rocks around it. It just would have been uh, the grass and ground. When you see these for adults, they're typically flower boxes or a curb. So in Victorian times, often they would uh, do what they called a flower box. So the grave would have a headstone, but then a stone barrier around. and individuals or family members would actually plant flowers inside. And so these were fairly common in the 1800s and early 1900s. Right here, you can see that this originally was a brick grave and then someone put a flower box inside of it and headstones. And of course, on the left, you see that sadly, one of the headstones has fallen in. Here's an example of scalloped headstone and shells. So a scalloped stone is very common uh, for children and kind of rebirth. And again, it has one of the cradles, but it was filled with gravel much later. And on the right, you see that the original grave was simply seashells placed, probably in cement, and then at a later date, a headstone. If you go through several um, cemeteries in the south, you will see variations of this type of headstone all over. These were kind of mass produced. So some of the first ones that you could actually just purchase this type of stone and then have it individualized to you with various inscriptions or even symbols, but they're called a pulpit marker. And you can kind of tell why it looks like a pulpit. This is examples of headstones and footstones. And often these were done literally just to mark where the grave would be so that you don't want to walk over this area. If you look at this one, you can tell right here how the ground is slightly indented. So you want to be very careful walking over these areas. Even if it looks just like grass or anything, be very careful where you step. These are cenotaphs. And that means that it is a headstone, but there is no body there. So these are usually in remembrance of somebody who may have died during the war, as each of these are. Um, they could have been traveling at some point or just gone missing. So a cenotaph is placed there um, 
it's not that their body is buried there, but it's usually placed with family members. And it will say at the bottom that it is a cenotaph. These are epitaphs, which are similar. So these are ones in this, in Statesboro for Bridger Jones and then William Cone, which both of them are buried within this area, but they were buried so long ago, we don't know the exact location. So they have no headstone, gravestone, or anything that still remains. So these epitaphs are in remembrance of them, but they also give a description of who they were, um, their family members, important deeds that they might have done, and when they passed away. Um, you've probably seen also memorials often. These are erected by descendants of the family, and you see that each of them it has memorial at the top. It might have a description of the progenitors, so to speak, so the parents, and then list where they lived, which church they might have been, and these are typically in graveyards, and then a list of their children, which could also have their birth dates, their death dates. I've seen some that even listed marriages for the children. A family stone can be a little bit um, different. On the left, it is similar to a memorial, but this is actually listing the family that are all buried in this cemetery, but their graves are unmarked. So it is still saying that this is the Maddox family, the Hammock family that are in this area. On the right, you see a family stone, which is basically indicating a plot of land that is for that, those individuals. These are wooden markers that are still standing. The left one, you can tell it is very weathered. There is no inscription that is visible. And to be honest, you do not even know which way the grave is going at that time. But of course, in most church cemeteries, which each of these are, uh, Christian burials are always going to face east. On the right, it is a wooden marker that they have placed in a stone and they've actually put a kind of metal top on it to try and preserve it a little bit more. You can see the inscription if you're at the right angle, but they've also put a stone marker behind it with the information. These are arched stones that are usually for a husband and wife. And this arch usually symbolizes um, the pathway to heaven. So on the left, you have one that is in a cemetery, and on the right, you have one in a graveyard. So the graveyard, at least at this church, you can tell that there are graves of all different shapes, sizes, materials, and things like that. Now we're going to go over military headstones and gravestones, which can vary quite a bit. The first type of military headstone was called a Civil War type, but it you, you have to know what that means exactly. So these were carved inside an image of a shield, which would have the name, the rank, and the home state of the soldier carved in the inset shield. They were originally only used for Union soldiers, but they can now be used for soldiers of the Revolutionary War, War of 1812, Indian campaigns, Spanish-American wars, and others. So if you see a stone like this that's called a Civil War type, but it's for a revolutionary soldier, you know that that was placed obviously much later than the person there. And the individual doesn't necessarily have to be buried there because these are usually ordered um, as memorials and they are government issued. So they have a rounded tops and the shield is inset. They do not list any dates, which is unusual to me, but they typically list the war that they were in and the rank. So that kind of at least gives you a time period. Confederate soldiers were not provided with a military or government issued headstone until 1906. So their headstones are quite different. 
the top is pointed and there is no shield design. So that is one way to tell the difference between a Confederate soldier versus almost all others. Um, and excuse me for my typo, the words are carved inward and some have the dates, whereas the Civil War type, the letters are outset. And often you'll see a Southern Cross of Honor at the top of a Confederate soldier's stone. And then you have a general type. These began being used after World War I. Many of these are flush to the ground. Others are about four inches thick, 13 inches wide, and 42 inches above the ground. But of course, this isn't always the case, but this is another type of government issued headstones. Not all military headstones are government issued or official. So the veteran or family of the veteran can choose a different design that might have more information, um, various symbols on them where all of the government issued ones, or at least the Confederate style, they are very simple. Um, you're not gonna find flowers carved on them or leaves or anything like that. The general type, you might see a cross, a Star of David or something to indicate their religion. So these are two examples of the Civil War type. On the left, you have one for a revolutionary soldier. So you have his name, again, the state and rank and the name of the war. And on the right, again, you have the shield, the person's name, rank, state, and this is for the Spanish-American War. So a lot of it is abbreviated, but there are absolutely no dates on here. These are Confederate markers and the Southern Cross of Honor. So you have a Confederate stone, which you see is pointed, and it has a little emblem of the Southern Cross of Honor. And at the bottom, you will see that it actually does have the dates for the person when they were born and when they died. And the right is just kind of a more close up example of what the actual Southern Cross of Honor is. So this one was placed quite a, a while ago, but others you might find that actually have color in them and are very shiny, so to speak, very new. These are the general type of military headstones. So on the left, you see that there is a cross on it. It gives the person's name, the state, um, their rank, which war, and the dates. On the right, it says in memory of, so this means it was put at a later date. Again, it has person's name, their rank, um, and their dates. It actually does not list a state for this one. These are the bronze type uh, general markers. And remember I said that the bronze markers are typically installed on a stone. So on the left, you see that there's a Star of David for that individual of World War II, and on the right, an individual that has a cross for World War II. And on the right, you can tell that this stone was placed in 2017, so you can see the color difference of the words and the border, whereas the one on the left, it is much darker, the words are a little bit dark, but it would have looked exactly like the other when it was first placed. So it is just weathered and needs to be cleaned. These are non-government issued uh, military stones. So on the left, this is my seventh great grandfather. And originally it was just the upright headstone that had his name, his dates and information on him. But then um, the local SAR placed a second stone that gave more information on him. So it listed his military service, um, the various battles that he was in, who put the stone there, and also uh, who he served under. And then on the right, this is a headstone that was put for someone um, in the Revolutionary War, but you notice it does not have the shield on it. And the reason this would be a non-government is it has more information. It has the dates the person lived and died. It has a symbol on it. So that is much more information than would typically be put on a uh, Civil War type monument. So now we're gonna go over symbols and their meanings. 
gravestones often have carved symbols on them that may convey more information about the deceased than simply the inscription. And these are especially important if the inscription is faded, but you can still make out the symbols that are carved on there. Uh, some symbols do have more than one meaning or interpretation. So I'll, I'm trying to list as many of those as possible. And it's not always easy to identify the symbols if the stone is weathered or broken. And this is especially the case if um, it is flowers because there are so many different types of flowers that could be used as symbols on a gravestone and each one has a different meaning. So sometimes you might need to find pictures and the meaning um, online or have a sheet with you when you go to the uh, cemetery to try to compare and see if you can make out what type of flower it was. So I've got several slides coming up and they are examples of some of the most common symbols seen on gravestones. You have an anchor and the anchor typically meant a passageway to heaven and victory over death. And you see that these can go either way. It does not necessarily mean that the individual was a Marine or anything like that. The anchor is just a symbol that, you know, victory over death. And they can be with several other symbols as well. A crown. <clears throat> can mean life or glory after death, victory over death, and also resurrection. So this is an example of those that have more than one meaning. So on the left, you can tell it is still carved in there. It's not quite as ornate. Um, as time went on, they might put more points and various things to make the crown look more ornate. <laughs> On the right is an example, the headstone is actually broken, but you can still see the crown on it. If you find one that has a crown with a cross going through it, this means that the departed soul is gaining victory over death through Christ the King. And so that's very specific as to what that meaning is. Doves are something that are also very common. If it is a resting dove, which might be on carved on top of the stone, it represents peace and innocence. You, you can find doves on um, children and individuals that died young often. If it is flying, it means the Holy Spirit. And if you see a dove with an olive branch in its mouth, it represents peace, which as you can see, each of these are flying doves with the olive branch. And this is very symbolic um, in Christianity of the story of Noah's Ark and the dove returning with an olive branch. And then often you can find a book or a Bible carved on or a headstone or place there. Uh, often this can mean that the person could have been a clergyman or you know a pastor but not always it can also mean that the deceased was a devoted religious person and it also represents the person's good deeds being recorded in the book of life so if you see a book open to the like the right where you see both sides that's typically representative of a bible and on the left it is a book that is closed which can mean, you know, the good deeds or the person is just simply religious. These are drapes, which are very intricately carved and you see the little tapestries at the end of it. Um, they mean mourning and grief. Back in the 1800s and uh, early 1900s at times, the body would also often be placed in a parlor for viewing but furniture and various things would have drapes over them. So this is representative of that. You can also find curtains or cloth. And if you'll notice, these are kind of similar to the other images, just because I wasn't able to find um, stones with a simple cloth. But these usually mean a veil between the living and the deceased. Um, it can also indicate humans shedding their mortal body to join God and the protective nature of God. And so a, curtains or cloth, they're typically not going to have tassels on them. 
So they would be simply folds of cloth like this, but you would not see the tassels. Then you have the hand pointing up, which you will find this very commonly on older stones. And this means that the depart departed has gone to heaven and is asking the grieving and the mourning loved ones to look up. So it is indicating that that person has gone to heaven, basically. When you have the hand pointing down, which you can also find, it does not mean that the person went to hell, which some believe, but it means that God is reaching down for the soul of the deceased. And it can also mean that it was a sudden or unexpected death. On the left, you see the flowers, which I believe are Easter lilies and pointing down, which would re represent um, God's hand reaching down because that was a um, young adult. And on the right, you can tell that it is reaching down, but there are chain links. So a hand with broken chain links, this, is, this will mean a loss in family or a break in the family chain. So this often, the person died unexpectedly. Um, they weren't sick or anything. It was just something that was very sudden. So this will often have a chain. And these are examples of hands holding other objects. You have a hand holding a book or most likely a Bible and then a hand with a cross. Handshakes are something else that you might see often. And you have to look at these very closely because they have different meanings for how the hands are positioned. Typically, it means a final farewell or an eternal bond between the living and deceased. So if they are clasped hands where both the fingers are inter interlocking, that would mean a finer, final farewell. And on the right, you can tell that one hand is kind of limp, the fingers are straight where the other hand is holding it. And that is representing that eternal bond between living and deceased. So the closed hand would be the person who is deceased and the hand that is open is the person living. And then you have handshakes between a husband and a wife, which typically mean eternal devotion. These you have to look very careful of and you will notice that the um, sleeve of the hands are different. So here you have a very straight sleeve and here you can tell that there are small frills. So other times the female sleeve might be more uh, fluffed out, so to speak. And the wife is typically always going to be on the left where the husband's hand is on the right. And this is another example, and I know you can't see the sleeve right here very well, but this is the husband's sleeve that has the button on it, and then the wife's sleeve, it also had uh, the little frills on it, or kind of like lace. And a very, another very common symbol are the compass and square, or most people know them as the Masonic emblem. And these are for Freemasons. On the left, you see that it's at the very top and then it does have information. On the right, which is a newer granite stone, you can see it at the bottom, but you can also tell that this person is was Jewish and they were still a Freemason, which some people don't realize that Freemasons are not of a singular religious religion. Um, and please note, these are not in alphabetical order or anything. So this is a fern frond. So right here, you can see the fern very intricately carved. And you also see ivy up at the top. Um, a fern frond meant sincerity and humility. On the stone on the right, which has actually several carvings, but you can barely read the inscription any longer. So right here are the fern fronds. And again, it has ivy at the top and on the side, and then it also has Easter lilies. So you can interpret each of those symbols and learn something about the individual, even if you are unable to read the inscription any longer. You also might see a calla lily, 
These represent resurrection and rebirth, overcoming challenges, and faith and purity. So on the right, you see this is a child and a calla lily is placed on the top. So this is most likely uh, standing for resurrection and rebirth. And on the right, this one was just carved on the side that was quite large actually. And this person was much older, so it would represent faith and purity. These are Easter lilies, which mean the resurrection of Christ. So you have Easter lilies on each side of this, and then here's a child's grave with an Easter lily placed on it. Roses are also something that are very common. Um, these are roses that are in full bloom, which mean immortal love, and also the person was in the prime of their life. So if you see roses, you want to pay attention to them and how they are positioned. So if it is a closed bud, that typically means the person was a child or teenager. If the rose is in full bloom, which you can obviously tell right here, this one is also, it's just an older stone, so you can't quite see. But that means the person was in the prime of their life. They were very much alive and probably unexpected death. Um, and you'll also notice the three different leaves on the side. Um, trying to remember. The three leaves also represent something <laughs> that I cannot remember at the moment. But if you see a wilted rose or a tree that is leaning and wilted, that means the person had lived a long life. And these are roses that you can see it's a bud, but the stem is broken. So right here, you can tell how it is broken, bending down, as well as this one. So a broken stem means premature, untimely death or life cut short. So very symbolic to what it actually would translate to. And then you can also find poppies carved on stones. And poppy flower is something that has typically for hundreds of years represented eternal sleep. A wreath or a garland typically also mean victory over death. Um, these are each pictures of this is a garland and this is a wreath, I believe, which Sometimes you can find a wreath that is on an obelisk so you can see that it is kind of hanging and other times it's just carved. These are uh, stones called the open gates. Uh, they are usually on the pulpit uh, grave stones, but it will have a different meaning for the type. So the gates themselves are the passage from earth to heaven. And if you'll notice on the left, it has a bird or a dove flying. On the right, you have the hand pointing up, which would mean telling others to look up to heaven. And then these are two other examples, and you can see that the gates are often different. And so you have a star between one, and it's quite faded, but here you have a crown and a cross going through it. And when you see the crown, at the top of the gates, that is representing the pearly gates, so to speak. And this one also has a cloth over it, whereas this one has a book. So again, if they, many stones can have multiple symbols carved on them. You will often see a lamb on a child's grave, which represents innocence and purity. This was symbolic of the Lamb of God. An orb, which, basically a, a round symbol, a ball symbol on top, can mean the earth or cosmos. You can also find stars on several headstones. Um, this means light of Holy Spirit overpowering death. So on the right, again, this is a child's grave. It has the, la the lamb on the top, but it also has the star. So it's representative of the child overpowering death or their spirit overpowering death. And then when you have three stars, uh, that person has usually led a full life. Tree trunk or stump uh, headstones, 
are another meaning for a life cut short. So these are three children that have a small um, tree stump, basically. And you can also tell that there is a lamb on each of them as well. And you see that the design is pretty much the same on all of them. These were also one of those that were kind of mass produced and then you just carved the inscriptions. A weeping willow is something that is also often on headstones. And if you'll notice, both of these are standing up straight and tall, which actually mean immortality and life after death. This was symbolic of a branch of a weeping willow that it could fall or you can move it and it will actually grow a new tree. It does not die from just being cut from the main tree. So that is where the immortality and life after death comes. But of course, due to its name, the weeping willow, it can also represent mourning and grieving. Urns are often put at the top of monuments or you might see them uh, lower. And if you notice here, there's a ginormous ant bed, so be careful. <laughs> but an urn was representative that we all turn to ash or all turn to dust. Um, so at some point, everyone is to die. If you find a draped urn, that is symbolic of the person's family mourning and grieving. And so it is covered, whereas this one, you have the urn at the top and you have the drapes below it. Wheat is something else that can be very common and you'll have a sheath or a bushel of wheat. So this can mean believers over non-believers, uh, redemption, which means we must die to be reborn, and also the body of Christ, where it would represent uh, the bread. And also in that category, if you find grapes on a headstone, that would represent the blood of Christ. And these are palm fronds that you will often find. So victory of the spirit over the flesh. So this is very symbolic of Easter and uh, Christ returning. So palm fronds are very common and can be uh, going directly up. They can look more realistic. And here you see that there is a wreath that it is going through, but it means the victory of the spirit over the flesh. So these individuals were quite religious. Ivy, which we've already seen on a few, means immortality and friendship. And now these are some websites for gravestone symbols and you can pause the video so that you can read these and write them down. You don't have to copy the complete um, link. You can simply type in the title. So A to Z of gravestone symbols. And there are actually two slides of these. So this is the second and these are wonderful sites that many of them have pictures to show you what the type of stone or the symbol would look like and it will give you the meaning and more specific details and then there are also like the a to z one that will list all types of various objects uh, flowers and animals various things that you might come across and again i put examples of ones that are the most typical in this area so I hope this has helped in giving you more information on cemeteries so that you're able to identify what these stones are telling you other than just the inscriptions. And remember, always be careful when you're going to a cemetery, make sure you follow the rules, you have permission, you wear the proper clothing, and it's usually advised to take someone with you. So, while this is October and Family History Month, why don't you and your family go to a cemetery where you might have ancestors buried? And it's always great, and it, at least to me, <laughs> and visit your family. Let me know if you have any questions. You can post them in the comments here. You can email me or call for an appointment or anything. Thank you.